All right. We are going to pull everyone together and begin our briefing today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here in the room, and thanks to everyone in our online audience, which I know is robust. Um, welcome to our briefing today, Cities Leading the Way on Nature-Based Solutions. Uh, I'm Dan Bursette. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, and in addition to thanking our great panelists for joining us today, I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Emanuel Cleaver II for helping with the room today. Couldn't be here without him. Uh, ESI is celebrating, we're halfway through our 40th anniversary year, and that's 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. We were founded by a bipartisan group of members of Congress, and uh, since about 1984, have worked to provide science-based information about environmental energy and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. We try really hard to make sure that our resources are timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. And I have an example of what that looks like. Uh, some of you may know that the House Agriculture Committee is marking up uh, a bill today, uh, a farm bill. Uh, it's exciting that we see text. Well, we have tremendous resources. Everyone's going to have to work on the farm bill at some point. And we have tremendous resources. This is our first of our side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison charts. And what this does is so cool. We started with the Rural Energy Savings Program because that's our favorite. What it does is it compares what's in the law with what the House is proposing and eventually with what the Senate's proposing. And it's all marked up so you can very easily look left to right, right to left, and compare with what the different chambers are proposing, what the committees are proposing, and then ultimately what the differences are that will have to ultimately be worked out. This was just posted this week. It's super exciting. There's more to come. And I encourage everyone to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, to make sure you don't miss a thing. Congressional education also looks a lot like this. Briefings, we do lots and lots of briefings. We've had briefings this year on the fifth national climate assessment, on the budget and appropriations process, so sustainable uh, energy in America Factbook. That was a really good one. Ocean carbon dioxide removal. And we'll actually be back up here in a few weeks for another look at nature-based solutions. On the front table, for those of you who are joining us in person, we also have an advertisement for our Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. That's going to be Tuesday, July 30th. We'll have seven panels uh, over the course of the day talking about climate solutions. And then we'll also have uh, an exhibition in the Rayburn foyer uh, with organizations and companies and government agencies will be setting up shop there and it's a great networking opportunity. So I encourage everyone to uh, join us for all of our stuff that you can, really. It's free, it's accessible, uh, and uh, it's always available online. And if you miss anything or if you any of the stuff I just said sounds really interesting, you can also visit our website, www.esi.org. Uh, Today, though, we'll be talking a little bit actually quite a lot, about what small and medium-sized cities are doing to take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to a changing climate. This is the portion of the briefing where I realize that I haven't advanced my slides, so I shall do that. Um, that's OK. Um, our briefing today will highlight key learnings from project implementation around nature-based solutions that are useful for policymakers to be aware of as new policies and investments are devised and ready for deployment in the field. Cities are doing far more than we can cover in a single briefing, of course. So this will actually be the first of several briefings extending into next year that will put the spotlight on small and medium-sized cities and document all the ways they are leading the way on climate action. Today, our focus will be nature-based solutions, and that's things like parks that help manage stormwater to urban trees that can reduce suburb temperatures across entire neighborhoods. Our panelists will highlight equitable and community-designed climate solutions from the places they live and work and describe the intersection points with federal policy and programs. The slide that's up right now is a link to our survey. We'll also post it at the end of the briefing. But if you have any thoughts or comments, if you're in our live cast audience and you're having a problem with the audio or video, if you have ideas for future briefings, please take a moment and let us know what you think. We read every response, and we do our best to, to respond to those. And uh, we really, really appreciate the time that you take for that. So we are joined today by a very special guest via on of pre-recorded remarks, and that is Representative Emanuel Cleaver II. Representative Cleaver is serving his 10th term representing Missouri's 5th Congressional District, which happens to be the home of President Harry Truman. He is, the mem he is a member of the House Committee on Financial Services, the ranking member of the, on the Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance, member of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets, and a member of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. He also is a co-chair of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, which gives us lots of opportunities to work with him and his awesome staff. After serving for 12 years on the City Council of Kansas City, Missouri, 
He was elected as the city's first African-American mayor in 1991, and his record as mayor of Kansas City is full of economic development and redevelopment success stories. So we'll pull up the video from Representative Cleaver, and then we'll get the rest of the briefing underway. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues. It is a pleasure to join you all virtually and to welcome you to today's congressional briefing hosted by the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. As we gather here today, we are presented with a unique opportunity to discuss nature-based solutions as a means to address climate change and the existential threat it presents to this planet. And while I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you in person, we have some of the brightest minds in America when it comes to sustainability that will help you provide yourselves with some insight and information that I hope will be useful to your work moving forward. But let me kick off this briefing by saying, just as Mother Nature has provided us with all the tools we need to build the remarkable civilizations we see today, she has also provided us with the tools necessary to protect our planet for the generations of tomorrow. However, the onus is on us to implement the policies that will maximize the impact of these nature-based solutions, like my Bipartisan Trees Act. The Trees Act is a simple, common sense piece of legislation that holds immense potential for shaping a more sustainable future. It would enable the planting of millions of trees in cities across the country helping to lower energy costs, combat the heat island effect, and mitigate the impact of climate change nationally. Policies that emphasize nature-based solutions like the Trees Act represent a crucial step forward in our collective effort to combat climate change and foster resilient communities, particularly in urban America. I've witnessed firsthand the transformative impact that investments in our urban green infrastructure can have on communities, such as combating unhealthy pollution and improving air quality, and underscores the importance of equitable access to sustainability, regardless of background or zip code. As we delve into today's discussions, let us remain steadfast in our commitment to advancing policies that prioritize the health of our planet and the well-being of our communities. Together, we can turn the vision of a greener, more sustainable future into a reality. Thank you so very much. Have a great conference. Thank you, Representative Cleaver, for joining us uh, and sharing your remarks with us today. Uh, always great to hear from you, and thanks for your leadership on these issues. We have, um, like Representative Cleaver said, a tremendous panel. We're going to learn a lot from them, and that's going to make you have questions. We'll have time for questions at the end of our panel. Uh, if you're in the uh, in-person audience today, we'll have a microphone, and we'll call on you, and. Uh, we have some teed up, of course, but we'll have lots of time for you to have questions. If you're in our online audience, you can ask us a question by sending us an email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. You can also follow us on social media uh, at EESI Online. We'll be uh, having real-time coverage on our Instagram story and X. Our first panelist today is Peyton Seiler-Jones. Peyton is the Interim Director of Sustainability and Innovation at the National League of Cities and the founder of Seiler Climate Con uh, Consulting. She brings 10 years of experience in supporting climate solutions through facilitation, equitable community engagement, local climate planning, program management and evaluation, policy analysis, project management, and strategic communications. Prior to joining the National League of Cities, she designed local resilience plans at Linnean, Linne Linnean Solutions and served as a climate resilience project manager for the city of Boston. Peyton, it's so great to have you on our briefing today. I'll welcome you to the lectern. I'll take my tent card to make room for yours and really looking forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. And thank you so much to EESI. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here to talk about city leadership on nature-based solutions. So as Dan said, my name is Peyton Seiler-Jones, and I'm currently serving as the Interim Director of Sustainability and Urban Innovation at the National League of Cities in the Center for Municipal Practice, which is a mouthful. 
So I'm really going to kind of set the scene today for all the other great detail that the, the remainder of the panelists will provide. So I'm going to talk about city-led nature-based solutions and sort of the state of that right now, and also start to provide some examples of how small and medium-sized cities are really leveraging the once in this this once in a generation moment of bipartisan infrastructure law dollars to implement some of these solutions. So as everyone in this room knows, climate change is having an enormous impact on natural systems around us. And nature can be an incredible tool to slow and mitigate climate trends um, by really supporting and leveraging the benefits of living systems. So in one report published in June 2021, FEMA defined nature-based solutions as sustainable planning, um, design, environmental management, and engineering that really weaves in natural features or processes into the built environment. And these solutions can combat climate change in a number of ways, from reducing flood risks to improving water quality, protecting coastal property, restoring and protecting wetlands, stabilizing shorelines, and reducing urban heat, and so much more. Um, another really significant characteristic of nature-based solutions is that they provide so many benefits beyond climate benefits. So they can allow more access to nature, to recreation spaces for residents, um, improve air quality, beautify communities, um, and really restore and maintain living systems that are essential to human life on the planet. So there are really essential tools at every level of government um, for implementing nature-based solutions. But at the municipal scale, which is, of course, our focus today, there is tremendous opportunity um, for implementing these solutions. Um, everything from land use planning, hazard mitigation planning, stormwater, transportation, open space planning. Um, but when it comes to, to municipal scale nature-based solutions, I think of kind of three buckets coarsely. So there's land conservation and management, which is really more of a preventative measure. Um, this is about sort of mitigating cli climate impacts before the land degradation occurs. So preventing practices like draining wetlands, destroying grasslands, ecosystem um, destruction through the cutting of trees. So really, again, sort of preventing the problem before it starts. Then the second bucket I think about is sort of drawing down and sequestering carbon, so reducing emissions through nature-based solutions. And depending on where a community is, there's a, a number of opportunities there. So in coastal communities, there can be offshore solutions like aquatic systems. In more rural communities, thinking about regenerative agricultural practices. Um, and, and then in communities across the country, parks and open space offer a great opportunity for sequestration. The third bucket, which I think is probably the most common that folks hear about when it comes to nature-based solutions, is that preparedness bucket. So we know climate change is happening now, and it's going to continue to affect cities across the US and across the world. So thinking about nature as a tool to be leveraged with its incredible abilities to really build community resilience and adapt to local climate impacts, which of course, those impacts will be different depending on where you are. Um, in the country or in the world. But that can be planting trees to reduce heat, which we'll hear more about in a bit, um, or restoring waterways, um, shorelines for flooding mitigation, and so much more. So when it comes to nature and the built environment, of course, in so many ways, it's a tangible infrastructure solution. But we know that space and the built environment isn't just a tangible infrastructure thing, it's also social. So it's really deeply connected to political and human social systems as well. So as we're thinking about nature-based climate solutions, it's critically important to start with people and look at these solutions with social equity at the core. And that can take a number of different forms. So one example is equitable distribution of ecosystem services. For example, historically redlined communities, which are still disproportionately black and brown, usually have less green infrastructure, fewer trees because of systemic disinvestment. So city leaders have an opportunity to leverage the implementation of nature-based solutions to repair harm from racist housing policy, as one example. 
Another example is centering social equity in the distribution of economic opportunities. So thinking about workforce development and allowing opportunity for youth, for women, people of color, formerly incarcerated individuals, et cetera. And finally, I think it's really important to consider the whole and consider how intersectional all of these issues are at the municipal scale. So for example, thinking about housing and housing affordability and recognizing that nature is really nice, it's beautiful, and it can often increase property value. So how do we consider that in the implementation in our cities? Maybe we start with affordable housing and then we talk about building the park. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of case studies and as Dan mentioned, really focusing on smaller and medium-sized communities who have leveraged bill dollars and implementing some of these solutions. Before I dig into my official case studies though, I do wanna just share a, a quick personal anecdote, which is that last week I was in St. Paul for the National Adaptation Forum and it's no mow May in St. Paul, which is a really simple solution. You just don't mow for the month of May. Um, but this policy passed the city council six to zero and I think it's really awesome because it's amazing for native wildlife, for soil regeneration, which has a number of ecological and also climate benefits. So shout out to St. Paul. So up first um, with the case studies is Bitten Harbor, Michigan. So this is a town just under 9,000 people. It's a majority black community and they were able to leverage NOAA's Office of Habitat Conservation bill funding to start to revitalize Ox Creek, which runs right through the town and has been experiencing a lot of stormwater runoff, flooding, which has been problematic for a number of fairly obvious reasons. So they're developing a restoration plan that really centers nature-based solutions in this community to think through restoring this waterway, cleaning it up, using it as a catalytic opportunity for economic development in the community while also mitigating stormwater runoff. So the bill funding really is directly supporting climate adaptation in a Justice 40 community. So moving south to the city of Mobile, Alabama, a solidly medium-sized community with a population under 200,000 people. So they um, have received funding through the National Park Service Bill Program, the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program. Um, and the city is activating this, this money to build a new recreational destination with open space, exercise equipment. Um, and so obviously this is gonna have stormwater and heat benefits, but it's also going to be a space that is activated for public use, which is really fantastic. And finally, moving west a little bit, South Sioux City, Nebraska, a town of just under 14,000 people. They're utilizing USDA urban and community forestry grant money to invest in their tree canopy. So they're doing a number of things with this grant. They're developing, developing a community forestry plan, um, and they're actually, you know, getting out planting trees. There's a workforce development component to this. So some pretty exciting work, which again, there's a lot of benefits to planting trees, which you'll hear more about soon. Um, but a great example of a smaller community really leveraging this money to do some exciting work. So I really could go on and on with case studies of how cities, towns, and villages are really leading the way when it comes to climate action in general. Um, but specifically in spending the bill money to do really awesome nature-based solutions work. Um, but I'll wrap up my, my remarks for the most part, but I'll just end by saying that it's important for there to be networks of support and peer learning for these communities as they're figuring out, okay, what are the real benefits for me given climate impacts where I am? What are the barriers that are common for municipal governments across the board? So the National League of Cities has a number of technical assistance and peer learning programs, including the Smart Surfaces program, the Greening Schoolyards program, um, but there's also so many city-facing organizations, climate-focused organizations who offer technical assistance. So we're always happy to connect you know, federal staff, city staff, whoever has questions about that with the right organization doing the right work in this space. Um, but I think there's a lot of value kind of regardless of where you are in, in this work to be building those partnerships and building those connective peer learning networks. So with that, I will say thank you all so much and I will wrap it up. Thank you, Peggy. That was a great presentation. And I love that photo at the end. I've had a chance to go to a couple NLC events over the years and it is just collections of doers. It's just people who are really motivated to do the right thing and it's really fun to watch them network and share ideas and things like that. 
Um, I need to learn more about this no-mo May because I tried a no-mo April and my grass started to seed. <laughs> it was so hot, it was so wet here. But um, you said something about learning more about planting trees. Well, Joel Pennell is gonna help us with that. Joel is our next panelist and he is the Vice President for Urban Forest Policy at American Forests. In this role, Joel works to build and maintain relationships with policymakers, senior government officials, partner organizations, stakeholders, and other related entities to advance policy centered at the intersection of urban forestry and social equity. For more than 10 years, Joel has played a leading role in expanding equitable access to public lands, including the creation and significant growth of the only federal grant program addressing park equity in cities, as well as the launch of the 10 minute walk campaign, which sounds delightful. Prior to joining American Forests, Joel led uh, Sierra Club's Outdoors for All campaign and directed urban policy for the Trust of Pub for Public Land. Joel, we'll get you teed up here with your slides. Really looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks for being here. My own timer here, so I don't go over it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Thank you to Representative Cleaver for hosting us. Um, and for all of you all for being here, I always say you could be anywhere in the world and you have decided to be here with us. So thank you um, to all those who are watching online as well. Um, so again, I'm Joel Pinnell with American Forest. Um, we are the oldest national nonprofit organization in the country. We're going to celebrate next year our 150th anniversary. Um, and so we have been doing urban forestry work um, since for, for 100 years, so since the U.S. first became a majority urban nation. And so we work, our policy work is really um, in two sides. We talk about in two sides, resilient forests, which is all about uh, creating healthy, resilient forests in large landscapes, the national forest system, and then also the work that I focus on, which is urban and community forestry uh, that we call tree equity. And so why do we need tree equity in cities? Um, so some of the things that Peyton was just mentioning about how in almost every city and country, uh, small, medium, and large, there are huge discrepancies in terms of which neighborhoods have adequate tree canopy and which neighborhoods don't. And so uh, we have uh, developed a tool called Tree Equity Score that I'll talk about a little bit later. The data from that tool shows us that nationally, neighborhoods with the lowest poverty rates have double the tree cover per person and are six degrees on average uh, cooler than neighborhoods with the highest poverty rates. Additionally, neighborhoods with the fewest residents of color have four times more tree cover per person and are 13 degrees hotter than neighborhoods with the most people of color. And so why, why is that significant? Um, oops, oops. Actually, uh, I was remiss in omitting two slides here, so I'm gonna, uh, Talk about why that's so significant. Extreme heat kills more people than all other uh, extreme weather events in the United States, uh, more than hurricanes, floods, and tornadoes combined. And, so, and we actually think the number is undercounted. And so uh, Duke University ran a study that says that we have about 12,000 heat-related deaths per year. And if we do not take significant action uh, to reduce extreme heat temperatures, that number is going to rise to 100,000 by the end of this century. And so this is a life and death issue. It's also a quality of life issue. So we're talking about um, the grandmother who is waiting at the bus stop that doesn't have shade to go fill her prescription. And increasingly, there are days out of the year where she's risking her life to do so. The grandfather who's trying to play with his grandchildren at the park, and the, there's increasing number of days where it's too hot to do so. And so these are, are life and death issues. They're quality of life issues that affect all Americans and and we need to take climate action now in addition to the extreme heat reduction benefits of trees uh, you know heat uh, trees are also our best air filter we I talked about them as our best air conditioner they're also our best natural air filter they avoid, avoid millions of incidents of respiratory illness annually you look at um, cities across the country Richmond Virginia which is my hometown Newark New Jersey uh, Detroit, Michigan, childhood asthma rates in those cities are four times what they are uh, compared to the state average in surrounding counties. And so these, again, the areas that need trees the most and benefit the most from trees are the areas uh, that are lacking in tree canopy syst systemically across the country. Um, there's also the carbon sequestration benefits. There's the energy saving benefits um, that I'll talk a little bit more here. And so 
the Forest Service has done research that shows that trees and forests in America annually save, and urban areas in America annually save $4.7 billion in electricity and $3.1 billion in energy costs. So we're talking about nearly $8 billion in savings based on having the right trees planted in the right places. And um, again, here you see the sequestration and other energy savings benefits. Um, so American Forest, what we're doing to address this issue is that we have developed a tool called Tree Equity Score. Um, and this score is available to anyone with internet access and it, it helps really come up with a national standard to assess how well cities are equitably delivering the benefits of trees uh, to all of their residents. And so this is available to 190,000 urban neighborhoods. Neighborhood would be a census block group. That's over 12,000 cities and towns, and it's 80% of the population. I'm going to talk in a little bit about the uh, USDA Forest Services Urban and Community Forest Program. And some people, I don't think I need to tell this audience, um, but a lot of people hear the word urban, they think of big cities. Uh, this program covers 84% of the country. So more than four and five out of us live in what is now considered an urban area. Uh, and so that is your, again, your medium, your small and medium sized cities all the way up to our larger cities. And so this is a tool that we have developed so that cities, it's not really comparing cities to each other, like walk score and park score, or some other tools. It's comparing neighborhood by neighborhood, how, is a city making sure that the benefits of trees are delivered equally to those neighborhoods. And so it measures uh, things like surface temperature, income, uh, health vulnerability for seniors and children, and it comes up with a score for how each of these census block groups are doing that. So I'd encourage you when you have time to go to treequityscore.org and you can find uh, what your neighborhood, how your neighborhood scores in terms of, of tree equity. And again, this really is about democratizing data and so we want this to be able to be used by uh, your everyday citizen, a, a, a elementary school kid who wants to know more about their neighborhood, all the way up to the White House. And so, you know, I uh, was talking with the chief heat officer of Miami-Dade County, Jane Gilbert, a few weeks ago, and she was saying how community groups um, and community advocates were coming in who all, all they wanted to talk about previously was affordable housing, uh, criminal justice reform, all, all important issues. She said they're now showing up at these meetings and talking about tree equity score uh, because of this tool and because they want an even more ambitious tree canopy plan than what Miami-Dade is already doing. And so that's what the tool was designed designed to do. And so we're happy to see that it's being used, used in that way. Uh, in addition, and I'm realizing this is not the easiest slide to read, <laughs> in addition to our national tree equity score tool, we also have tree equity score analyzer. And Tree Equity Score Analyzer is where you can really dig deep in the data. You can get down to the parcel or building level and do different uh, scenarios for if we were to plant uh, X amount of trees here, what would the eco service system benefits be? Um, and each TESA is developed, we call them TESAs, Tree Equity Score Analyzer, is developed with a local stakeholder council. We really believe that the only way for this work to be sustainable and to be transformative and meaningful is if you have buy-in from the residents who are most impacted by these climate disparities that we're seeing. And so the first step in each process is to build an inclusive partnership. Uh, so that, again, you're hearing from the people who are trusted and speak for uh, the neighborhoods and the residents who are, who are, again, most impacted by extreme heat and all the other disparities that we see uh, with the lack of tree canopy. And beyond that, beyond those tools, what is American Forest doing to advance tree equity? So we are working um, on Tree Equity Score, Tree Equity Score Analyzer, and other tools, and getting those tools in the hands of as many people as possible. And so that's where we really see this work um, being helpful to cities of all sizes, particularly those lower capacity cities that don't have uh, the resources to have chief heat officers or staff working on these things. And so we've created, working with partners to create a series of tools that are, are available, publicly available, so that anyone can use them. We're also working to build career and opportunities around uh, increased tree canopy and, and protection, and then uh, funding a movement. And so a lot of the policy work I have been doing that American Forest does is working with uh, you all in Congress and working with other partners to create the sort of funding that we saw in the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, where we saw $1.5 billion go to the USDA Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Program. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then also just raising awareness of this issue. I think a lot of us, um, speaking for myself who grew up 
with some relative privilege in a nice leafy neighborhood. And you sort of take for granted when you go to neighborhoods that don't have the natural cooling, natural air cleaning benefits of trees. And so really raising awareness on this issue and show, uh, again, as Peyton was talking about the intersectionality of this issue, where you don't have to make a choice between affordable housing and adequate access to green space. Those two things should go hand in hand. And so one of the other tools that I'll talk about is our climate adaptation and uh, health guide that we did in partnership with the Forest Service. And so this guide is available on vibrantcitieslab.org. And really we talk about planting trees and protecting existing canopy, um, but often it's, you know, what are the right types of trees to plant? Uh, what are the trees, the species that are optimal for human health and for climate uh, adaptation and resilience? And so, again, with the warming climate, we're seeing that trees that are, were native and are, were uh, to a particular region are now facing increased threats from invasive uh, species, um, other drought and other uh, issues. And so we need to be looking forward at what are the trees, the right trees to plant in the right places. And this is a, a, a publicly available guide that will help folks do that. Um, and then on the workforce development piece, I think this uh, cannot be underscored. Um, again, we're very thrilled, uh, as others are, to have seen all of these recent federal investments um, through the infrastructure law and through the IRA. Um, we think at American Forest, it is a moral imperative that if we're investing in these communities that have been systemically uh, under-resourced and we're creating um, jobs, related to urban forestry, those jobs need to go to the residents of those communities who have been most impacted. They're the same neighborhoods that have also been economically disenfranchised for generations in this country. And so um, we think it's a disservice to contract all of that work out to other people who don't live in those neighborhoods. And so we have a career pathway program that we've developed at American Forest. And it is really, again, taught all of the vast array of jobs and career opportunities related to urban and community forestry maintenance and care. And one of the things that we've done with that is we've developed an arbor, arboricultural pre-employment curriculum. And so we worked with private employers like Davy Tree Care Company. We worked with community-based organizations and workforce organizations to really um, come up with a guide that has the tools for what folks need and what employers need to bridge that gap. Often you are dealing with folks who have uh, wraparound service needs. And so that's related to um, child care development, job readiness. And so we're working with them to prepare them, not just creating the jobs, but creating uh, career pathways and workforce. Um, so I only have a minute left. I'm going to skip <laughs> ahead a little bit. To, I'm, a, I'm a policy person. American Forest is doing a lot of programmatic work. We're happy to partner with the Forest Service on uh, regranting about $40 million of that uh, $1.5 billion investment. So we're working with 39 subawardees of small and medium-sized cities mostly uh, to help them implement their uh, Inflation Reduction Act dollars. Um, but what I wanted to leave you all with, we're doing place-based partnerships in face places like Phoenix, uh, close to the, to the mayor. Uh, and, and the stat that I will throw out is that in Maricopa County alone last year, more people died from extreme heat than all homicides combined. So that, again, the seriousness of this issue. But what I want to leave you with is um, just talking about our policy framework and opportunities that you all have um, doing the important work you do on the Hill to really advance this work. And so we need a whole of government approach to this. Uh, the 1.5 billion for urban community forestry was great, but that program cannot return to a 35 to $40 million annually appropriated program. There was over $6 billion in requests for that, uh, for those funds. And so we really think there are so many opportunities uh, for a whole of government coordinated approach across agencies and really to get the technical assistance, uh, some of which I talked about, better delivered um, to all communities, particularly those small and medium-sized communities that have lower capacity. Um, and so with that, I will wrap it up, but thank you. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, uh, it's a good chance to remind everyone too that if you'd like to go back and rewatch any of the briefing today, you can do that at our website, www.esi.org. You can also uh, visit our, the briefing page for all of the presentation materials. So Peyton's presentations, Joel's presentations, everyone's presentations are available online. We also have printouts of the slides on the front, uh, on the check-in table too. So if you somehow manage to get in the room without those, uh, you can definitely grab them on your way out. Um, also, since we've had some people join since we kicked off, we will have a Q&A period. Uh, we will have uh, questions in the room for sure, but also in our online audience. You know, a lot of people have joined us uh, as well on there. The email address to use for online questions is ask, that's ASK, at ESI.org. 
Uh, and um, I, uh, yes, I wrote a note here, but I don't know what it says. Tree equity score. I was going to say something about tree equity score and how cool that is, Joel. Sorry. Well, I'll come back to that because it is such an awesome it's tool. Cool, it is really cool. Yeah. Uh, I need more detail. That'll be my next note that I write. Uh, all right. So um, our next presenter uh, is from all the way, Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, Flagstaff Mayor Becky Daggett is a decisive problem solver who's skilled at both building consensus and cultivating trust and respect. With an awareness that real change requires contrasting perspectives at the table, Becky is a leader who actively invites all voices and ideas into municipal decision making. She's a Flynn Brown Fellow with the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership, and she served in Arizona governor as a co-chair of that governor's Growing Smarter Oversight Council. She spent some 20 years actively involved in land use planning, open space preservation, economic development, the arts and public education, and is the executive director of several nonprofit organizations working with the city of Flagstaff and as a volunteer. I know how busy mayors are. It means a lot that you're with us today. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of stuff to commanding your attention back in Flagstaff, but we've got you for the next little while and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Welcome to the briefing. Well, thank you. It is an honor to be invited here to talk about a project that we have done in Flagstaff. This is the recorder. This is the clicker. Okay. All right. So I am from the city of Flagstaff, and most people, what they know of Arizona is desert. Flagstaff is at 7,000 feet at the base of the highest point in Arizona, which is Humphreys Peak at about 12,000 feet. Uh, it snows, it gets really cold, and it's getting increasingly warm in the summer, so much so that uh, it can become quite uncomfortable because we never had air conditioning in any buildings in Flagstaff, and, and now I'm even contemplating um, installing some. So one, two of our major issues in Flagstaff are wildland fire and resulting flooding. So flooding in August 2021 turned neighborhood roads into raging rivers. If you Google um, Prius flooding, floating, you will probably um, be able to find a video from Flagstaff of a Prius that was being moved down the road with floodwaters. Flagstaff Unified School District evacuated schools um, as they rapidly filled with water and community members worked together to protect homes from severe flooding. The students in the WF Killip Elementary School were displaced because of this flooding for the entire school year. And um, it's anyone who's been involved in flooding knows it's quite traumatic. And it's traumatic when parents don't know what's going on at their kid's school and it's flooding and they can't get to their kids to pick them up. So it was, it was quite the scene. A quote here, it looked like the Grand Canyon Rapids running down the street. It was pretty traumatic. Um, and this was from a person whose offices are across the street from Killip Elementary. Our Green School Yards program um, is a partnership between the Children and Nature Network and um, National League of Cities, Killip Elementary, U of A Cooperative Extension, a local nonprofit called Terra Birds, and our own sustainability office. So the program is, um, it, first of all, Killip was the selected school as the first location because it is located within um, a neighborhood that was severely impacted by climate change. It's a diverse neighborhood. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in Flagstaff and the school's commitment to serving indigenous community members. It's a very diverse school and really a, a neighborhood anchor for the Sunnyside neighborhood. It has a long history of growing food for the neighborhood and the need to maintain the school garden in the rebuild. 
that one, one part of the flooding, one, one solution that came from the flooding was to use Killip's fields as a floodwater detention basin. So in the, if we do receive the kind of flooding that we saw previously where it flooded the school, we've now built a detention basin to be able to capture that water. When it's not filled with flood water, it, it's um, their fields for softball and everything else. So the school site redesign included this basin and um, it doubles as green space for the students with planted trees and native plants. A new garden club and junior master gardener program was established. And, and a benefit I think, I hope to see come out of this is there's one park in this neighborhood which is adjacent to the school and I hope to see that park extended through grant funding that we're receiving for some of the flood mitigation work. So we can go back in and, and right some wrongs that were done to this community, not only in flooding, but just in available parkland. We established a youth therapeutic horticulture wellness program and pollinator garden. Food scraps collected from the school are transformed into nutrient-rich compost to be used on school grounds and during lear learning opportunities. Through this dedicated space and ed educational opportunity, students discover how to care for not only plants as they grow, but for people as well. Here are some of the quotes. I think my favorite one is, I get so excited about gardening club, I could just scream. So uh, some of the educational experience include carbon sequestration and removing air pollutants, increased stormwater capture, increase in children's long-term sustainability behaviors. This is a, a particularly important one because we know that big change needs to be made in our culture. And adults are, many adults are doing a great job, but we're really going to rely on this next generation to better understand the challenges that we're facing and be able to, to use their creative, um, their creative minds to address them. Increased home values, increased climate resiliency, impact on community physical and mental health, and return on investment for school districts. Flagstaff collaborated with more than 10 other communities sharing resources, implementing similar pro programs across the US. Green schoolyards were invaluable partners when it came to providing technical support, providing funding to implement various projects, and guidance to pursue additional funding. And this was particularly helpful for small cities that don't have, we don't have the staffing capacity as other cities. Um, but with this technical assistance, we were able to show what is possible with just you know, a little help from partners. Some of the um, challenges that we face are um, Having, the, having policies of the various agencies line up, you know, the city has policies, any federal agency has policies, any private funder has policies, and just being able to make sure that timelines, reporting, policies line up and complement each other versus uh, creating obstacles for each other. The strength of the uh, program and its accomplishments would not have been possible without these community members and the local organizations. There's just no way that Flagstaff would have been able to take on this project. Now we do have a food systems focus as part of our carbon neutrality plan, um, but to, to go the extra step and get into schools, we needed that, um, that extra financial support. Municipalities like Flagstaff face challenges, such as limited sustained funding sources for projects like this. And often, we're not the only ones, we lack dedicated staffing capacity to focus on these programs. 
Federal grants supporting nature-based solutions that trickle down from states to municipalities and nonprofits make a significant difference. And I can say through our, um, our interactions with the ARPA funding, that federal funding that comes directly to the states is also, um, I mean, comes directly to municipalities um, is also very desirable for us um, without that middleman of the state. Although Arizona is fantastic, it is great to um, be able to obtain those funds without having to go through the state. With support, the example of Killip Elementary could be realized at many other schools within Flagstaff and surrounding communities. I mean, that's the great thing about a lot of these nature-based solutions is um, they don't take a lot of not all of them take a lot of complicated planning or implementation, right? This is getting kids together and building gardens and um, showing them how to grow food, showing them how to care for plants, how to eat healthy, um, as well as they got a, um, a lesson in flood water and dealing with and dealing with flood water and the challenges of dealing with flood water in an urban environment when everything is already built and you're trying to find places for that water to go. Future opportunities. Killip set an ex uh, excellent example and um, they are adding a community greenhouse to their campus and Uh, and are looking to partner with their sister schools throughout the Flagstaff Unified School District to add these types of gardens to, um, to other schools. But I think Killip was the important school to start with, again, because it is in a traditionally um, less served neighborhood, as one of the oldest neighborhoods has suffered from a lack of investment in the neighborhood. And despite that, this school has always been kind of a shining example of um, a community anchor that draws not only parents but members of the um, of the community that don't have parent that don't have children in the school. Uh, so it's just a shining example for the rest of schools in um, Flagstaff. Thank you. I can't even imagine how much the kids at other schools probably envy Killip Elementary. That looked so cool. Those kids looked pretty jazzed to get their little certificates. So um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really great. Um, we, that brings us to our final panelist of the day. Uh, Karen Chagru is an environmental protection specialist with the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Wastewater Management. She serves as a member of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Branch, where she helps promote the funding and implementation of water quality projects, particularly those addressing non-point uh, non source pollution and climate resilience. Before working with the Clean Water State Revolving uh, Fund, she worked at EPA's Office of Policy, where she assisted program and regional offices with the development and management of regulatory actions. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll welcome you to the lectern, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. I'll get it queued up for you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Again, my name is Karen Chagru, and I work for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Wastewater Management with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. So today I'm going to be talking about using the Clean Water State Revolving Fund for nature-based solutions. So what is the Clean Water State Revolving Fund? It's a federal state partnership program that provides low-cost financing for a wide range of projects related to wastewater infrastructure and water quality. And the purpose of this is to provide government assistance that is intended to reduce the cost of critical public health and environmental infrastructure. And by environmental infrastructure, we're talking about green and blue infrastructure as well as the, the traditional gray infrastructure. So how does the Clean Water State Revolving Fund work? 
So the Clean Water SRF receives federal appropriations each year, which are provided as capitalization grants to all 50 states plus Puerto Rico to capitalize on their, oops, I'm sorry, oops, to capitalize their state loan programs. And this is matched with appropriations from the state government. Um, and then those are all combined to create the state revolving loan fund, and which essentially serve as environmental um, investment banks. Because then the money then gets loaned out to recipients for qualifying water infrastructure projects. And then as the principal of those loans and the interest gets recycled back into the state program, those funds can then get loaned out again, and hence it creates the, resolving, the revolving nature of the program. So this slide shows who's eligible to use the Clean Water SRF. Um, and one caveat here is that eligibility does vary by state. And some states do not fund private systems or private entities. So we always encourage those that are interested in this funding to definitely talk with their state program um, if this would be an issue. So this slide covers some of the nature-based solution project types. Um, including habitat restoration, land conservation. Um, the key here is that um, there is a reasonable, expe reasonable expectation that the project will result in a water quality benefit. So what are the benefits of using the Clean Water SRF? Um, first off, it's very low cost financing, the interest rate runs from zero to market rate, and the average over the 36 years of the program's existence is 1.2. Um, also, there's the potential availability of additional subsidy in the form of principal forgiveness or grants. There's also no minimum or maximum loan requirement. Um, there can be extended loan terms up to 30 years or the life of the useful life of the project. Um, and repayments can begin up to 12 months after the construction is completed on the project. And lastly, the funds can be very flexible. They can be paired with other sorts of um, funding sources from federal sources such as FEMA, USDA. Um, they can be used um, as bridge funding until <laughs> grant funding comes in. And um, a lot of the panelists today have talked a bit about the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And that was really a historic investment in key programs and initiatives implement, implemented by EPA to build safer, healthier, and cleaner communities. And for the Clean Water SRF, that resulted in just over $11 billion to base funds and $1 billion to the Emerging Contaminants Program, and this is spread out over five years. And here are some of the key priorities, and I've circled resilience, um, climate resilience, because that's part of our focus today. And how do I apply for funding? I've just put a screenshot here, um, and you can see um, at the bottom there's a little highlighted section, and that link will take you to your state program contacts and your state web pages. Um, and we always encourage people to get in co contact with their state representatives and really go and look at some of the documentation um, and the ranking system, the state priorities for using the fund, um, to just get familiar with your state's program and build that ongoing relationship. And also, just a plug that bill funds are available now um, for a five-year period, so it's a good time to take advantage of this program. So now, um, getting into some of the more interesting aspects, talking about how <coughs> cities have actually used the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, starting off with the city of Harrisburg, the Capital Region Water is a municipal authority, and it developed a capital investment 
plan for green stormwater infrastructure throughout Harrisburg for the next four years. And they're doing this through a clean water SRF loan uh, to cover the multi-year cash flow needs. And this is through a programmatic um, loan structure. Um, and you can see some of the pictures here of the work that's already been done. Um, and these projects will help to capture urban stormwater runoff before entering the combined sewer overflow system and help to reduce the frequency and volume of overflows to the Susquehanna River and Paxton Creek. So the next example is the city of Cocoa Beach, Florida. And it wanted to reduce nutrients flowing into the Banana River Lagoon and further into the Indian River Lagoon system. So they used um, a clean water SRF loan along with an EPA 319 non-point source grant and leverage funding from other sources as well. And um, some of the pictures here show the green infrastructure work that was done there to help remove pollutants. Um, but it also revitalized the local area by um, beautifying the, the streetscape. The city of Waynesboro, Virginia, um, they wanted to reduce polluted runoff to the South River. And what they did was they took an open field that was basically serving as a detention basin and created a much larger, more efficient wetland stormwater retention system. And they used um, a clean water SRF loan along with a state grant to do that. And the stormwater ponds helped to retain and delay the flow of excess water. And the native plants helped to absorb the new nutrients from the stormwater runoff. The city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, had a historic flood in 2018, which degraded the riverbanks of the Santa Fe River, allowing agricultural runoff and trash to enter the river. So they received a, a loan from the Clean Water SRF to do a bank stabilization project. And they used green infrastructure principles and soft engineering to do that. It's on display in the photo here. Um, and the project reduces stormwater pollution, controls erosion, and improves water quality. The city of Jacksonville, North Carolina, had a uh, flooding issue that they wanted to address um, in the Thompson School Creek watershed. It was, water was being blocked through undersized culverts and a dam um, that resulted in flooding during heavy rain events. And this problem also inhibited fish passage for several anadromous fish species. So the city received a clean water SRF loan towards a drainage improvement project. And so what they did with the funding is they removed those culverts and dam and instead installed a bridge, which helped restore the natural hydrology of that area um, and improve the, the fish passage. They also took the steps to take out invasive species and plant native species. And protected that work with a conservation easement. The city of Dubuque, Iowa wanted to address a frequent flooding issue. And they did this in a creative way by taking out a one mile storm sewer section of piping and essentially daylighting the creek there. And so they did this through a clean water SRF loan of which six million of that loan was um, principal forgiveness. So they had a, a savings there. They also leveraged funding from other state programs um, and federal programs and used a mun municipal stormwater utility fee. Um, so this uh, protects some of the, the properties that were being flooded in the past, and it also promotes a healthy aquatic environment for fish. The city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they um, wanted to improve the conditions of Skunk Creek, which is a tributary to Big Sioux River, which serves as a drinking water source for the city. And the creek was on the state's impaired list for suspended solids. So the city um, used clean water SRF loans to obtain, um, to do non-point source work throughout the 100-year floodplain of the creek. Um, and they did this also um, through a practice called seasonal riparian area management, where um, funding is given to farmers to help um, restrict cattle access to the creek. 
and therefore um, it allows the riparian area to build up over time and um, thereby protecting the river from um, erosion and nutrients. Um, my last state example is uh, the city of Whitefish, Montana. And they were really um, forward thinking about um, uh, wanting to protect their natural resources, particularly the drinking water source. So they took out an $8.2 million loan for the purchase of a conservation easement for over 3,000 acres of land um, to protect the drinking water source. Um, and so they funded this um, not only through a Clean Water SRF, but through other sources, including voting to increase its resort tax by one percentage point. Um, so in addition to protecting the source water, um, this project works to also protect wildlife habitat and areas for existing recreational activities. So I also wanted to touch a little bit about um, EPA's free uh, water technical assistance. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law not only provided a large amount of funding for water quality projects, it also provided funding for our EPA's uh, technical assistant existing programs and new programs. And um, our TA providers really try to work with communities to help um, address their water quality challenges um, and they do they offer a variety of different services um, including planning and helping develop application materials to access uh, funding and this slide just shows who's eligible to receive the water ta services and lastly how can folks go about requesting water ta services um, you can go to our epa.gov water TA website and further down on the web page you can see that section help for your community and there's a form that you can click there um, to request uh, technical assistance so we just fill that out and that's it Thank you, Karen. Just click it till it's red. Great. Um, that was a really great presentation, Karen. You mentioned uh, one of the projects involved removing a dam. We actually did a briefing a couple weeks ago about dam removal uh, that was really excellent. And uh, I, that one's posted on our website. So if you want to learn a little bit more about how those sorts of projects um, uh, look in different parts of the country, too, I definitely recommend you take a look. We did that with um, American Rivers uh, was our partner. Uh, on that briefing, and it came out really, really good. Um, Representative Pingree joined us uh, for that one uh, as well. So uh, we are going to get into our Q&A. Um, my colleague Ulrich uh, has a microphone, so if there are questions in the room, please raise your hand, and we'll be sure to get to you as soon as we can. I'm going to kick it off, though, by um, asking a question that might be in some of your minds. It comes up when we do nature-based solutions briefings a lot, and that is, how can we ensure that these solutions implemented today have long-lasting and durable benefits. So Peyton, I'd like to start with you maybe, and then we'll go down and hear from the other panelists as well, but how, what, what are we doing to measure and monitor and evaluate these projects to ensure that they're delivering the climate benefits, but also the other multiple benefits that we all know intuitively that they do, but how can we ensure that they're durable and long-lasting? Yeah, great question, Dan. So I think a big, piece there for municipal governments in particular is thinking about maintenance before you actually implement the solution. So that will be really different depending on what the solution is, but making sure that you have the maintenance plan up front is critically important and figuring out who's responsible for keeping that nature-based or green infrastructure up to date. And I think kind of hand in hand with that, there's a big piece around sustainable funding sources. So having that upfront, whether it be capital money at the local level or a grant to help you actually put shovels in the ground and implement a solution is huge. Um, but it's a workforce opportunity to think about maintaining these solutions over the long term. So making sure that funding source is in place, again, whether it's operating budget at the local scale um, or some other more sustainable source of funding is critically important. And then your question about measuring success, I think Again, the indicator of success really does depend on the solution. So 
if you have a coastal resiliency solution that's putting oyster shells, you know, offshore, what success looks like there is going to be pretty different than if it's a, you know, what used to be a concrete median on a big roadway that floods and you add a green stormwater solution in that roadway. Um, so you just have to be really clear again up front in that maintenance plan, like, okay, what does success for this specific solution look like? Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I think it's really important to consider all types of value when we're talking about measuring success. So there's, you know, different things that matter to us in communities and being sure that we have good qualitative data and community conversations to inform how we measure success is really important. Um, so we have diverse perspectives in, in how we know we're getting it right. Thanks, Peyton. Joel, trees, hopefully when you plant them, they last a really, really long time. They grow really big. But for, for your work in your, in your space, how do you ensure uh, that these benefits are, are durable and long lasting? Yeah, I, I would echo some of the points that Peyton made in, uh, in terms of having a long-term maintenance and protection plan in place. Uh, the first three years of establishing a newly planted tree are really critical to that long-term survival. Um, and I think when we talk about uh, these really transformative impacts that tree canopy can have, it's not just a one-off. So that's one of the reasons we developed tree equity scores so that you're looking at what are the places that are going to benefit the most, not from planting a single tree, but are there? Uh, can we plant corridors? Can we... Uh, have that neighborhood investment from the beginning so that people are invested in taking care of the trees. Often we have seen uh, when we get uh, influxes of uh, public or private dollars for tree planting, um, if it's not done in consultation with the neighborhood, they're not, you know, you've got, you've got to plant trees that are culturally relevant, that are fruit bearing trees, that are um, connected to the people who are, are living with them. And so that way you're going to have that long term uh, stewardship of the tree canopy. And then lastly, I would say that we really have to um, quantify the benefits of trees. One of the issues that a lot of municipalities face is that um, trees are a great asset. We all know that. But when you're working um, sometimes in the mayor's office, it's a, it's a liability issue because you're dealing with hazardous tree removal. You're, have, you're getting phone calls about uh, power lines taking down trees. And so we've got to figure out a way, uh, American Forest is working with partners like Quantified Ventures and City Forest Credits, how are we really measuring uh, those long-term eco-service benefits of trees, those public health benefits? And so we're, we're starting that process, um, but that's, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in that area as well, and then and, and take some of those benefits and reinvest them in the long-term uh, maintenance and protection of the canopy. Thanks. Becky, your examples, you, I mean, you have to, you know, you, like Joel said, you take phone calls and you have to, you know, answer to voters, but for something like the Kilp um, Elementary School, how are you monitoring and measuring the benefits of that program, maybe to justify additional investments in other schools? Well, um, cities have the benefit of being right there with their communities. Um, and so partnerships are absolutely critical to any of these projects. And just as Joel was saying about the neighborhoods being bought in, keeping the neighborhood bought in helps to sustain the program and helps to expand the program. Mm -hmm. So I think Flagstaff Unified School District, seeing it as a benefit at Killip and seeing how it can be replicated at other schools and not just schools, where we're in the process of designing an indigenous community cultural center and, and a big part of this center is um, traditional plants and traditional herbs. And um, so j that, that buy-in is just absolutely key, and that's the key to longevity. Because if the city doesn't have the money to put into it, you have other partners that are equally invested in seeing its success, and everyone's working on making sure you have the money to fund it. Great, thanks. And Karen, for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, how do you measure the results of these projects that you provide loans for or provide financing for? Oh, Karen, could you turn your mic on? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think the states are uh, definitely taking a look at this um, and seeing how these types of nature-based solution projects perform, you know, over the long term. Um, I would echo what the rest, some of the rest of the panelists said about planning for not only financial 
um, success of these types of projects, keeping it, you know, early, early in the planning stage, thinking about operation and maintenance and those types of costs, but also the technical aspects of, of how to achieve those um, are important. Um, but also just talking about the benefits, you know, not, a, I mean, first off, measuring those benefits, but then you know, making sure that there's an open conversation about those benefits so that we can market those types of success. I mean, and so, yeah, so forums such as this, I think, are, are very mm -hmm. helpful in, um, you know, keeping the conversation around nature-based solutions, like, sort of up front and center. So I think that's important. Great, thanks. Um, Joel, I'm gonna start with you for this next one. And we've, you know, this panel is a great example. We have a local leader, we have the federal government, we have you know, collections of state leader, of, of other local leaders, but I'm curious how, um, if you have any additional thoughts about how organizations can partner with federal agencies, with state agencies, with other cities, uh, and other you know, community partners to advance nature-based solutions. What, what are you seeing in, uh, at American Forests? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, this work is not possible without with strong, inclusive partnerships, um, and not after plans have been made, but really at the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, the panel's talked about raising awareness, or you, you just made the point about raising awareness of this issue and keeping it going, and that's the intersectionality of natural climate solutions um, and, and the benefits they bring to communities is really important, but it's, we're not going, if you're not partnering with the housing folks and with the transportation folks, we have to um, cliche, but break down the silos of, of all this work. And natural climate solutions have so many uh, multiple benefits that are leveraged when you're really targeting investment and making programs more efficient. And I think that's where NGOs can really be a partner to the federal agencies in terms of getting the technical assistance, whether it's a federal government technical assistance or tools that national nonprofits and others uh, have developed, getting that into the hands at the grassroots and community-based organization level. Um, some of these federal grants, I echo the point uh, that the mayor made. Uh, we love states, we love municipalities, but what we saw with, um, with Bill and IRA is that when you can grant directly to the people closest to the work, uh, you're going to have the greatest impact. And there are capacity issues that smaller cities and community-based organizations face. And so we've got to partner and work together to address those capacity issues and not use it as an excuse to continue uh, to deny them resources. Yeah, great. Um, Becky, I know you have to run in a few minutes, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you've partnered with folks across you know, the Flagstaff community. But since you have to run, if there's anything else you would like to leave our audience with today, I hope you'll feel free to add, and be, um, you can have the um, you know freedom to talk about whatever you'd like for the next couple of minutes until you have to take off. Well, I mean, within reason, and nature-based solutions, please. Um, in terms of partnerships, the city of Flagstaff, our staff has done an outstanding job connecting with their uh, peers at the state level as well as the federal level, serving on commissions and boards at the state and federal level. And I find um, the federal agencies that we work with to be um, extremely accommodating and wanting, I mean, we feel like the agencies want to help our community and um, see themselves as partners in our success. So just the, the relationships, and I guess that's probably the answer to everything, relationships are so incredibly important and um, and then I think I would like to just end by saying um, you know we, we didn't we didn't talk a lot about um, fire and that's one of the issues facing Flagstaff and the cause of a lot of our um, flooding but the help that we've received from the EPA uh, for some of our forest health work as well as our residents tax themselves uh, to create a, the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Program years ago to work on forest health around our watersheds to um, protect our water quality and to um, try to avoid the, the flooding that we have seen in some areas. So 
there's, there's so much that can be done with nature-based solutions, and it's also something that's more palatable to the general public because it's so often beautiful and it just improves the quality of life. So it's a solution that uh, makes life better for people in your communities. Great. Well, thank you. I know you have to run, but let's just give you a quick round of applause for joining us, and thank you so much. I hope you make your plane, and I hope you have a safe flight back, and I hope you get an extra bag of peanuts or pretzels or, you know, maybe the, yeah, whatever, whatever you can get out of the, the stewards. Uh, yes, they have, I'll write you a little note so they'll be like, oh, you can have more peanuts. Um, great. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, Karen, I'd like to come to you now. I mean, you have a EPA and the states have a, a, you know, a very critical relationship, but I'm thinking about like what you're doing to make sort of that, you know, what, what you're doing at EPA to sort of promote those kinds of partnerships and to, you know, make things easier to access. I mean, for 36 years, you guys have been financing, you know, tremendous projects. So you're doing something right. I'm curious what that looks like. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we work um, very hard at, um, you know, collaborating with our state partners and our regional partners um, to make this a successful program. Um, and so, you know, we love to hear feedback, you know, and, um, you know, correct as necessary. Um, but I think what's really interesting to see is the partnerships that happen um, through the funding, mm -hmm. um, the leveraging of funds and, um, you know, the, the, the holistic view sometimes of watersheds um, and bringing in different partners that helps um, multiply the benefits, but at the same time reduce the costs. So um, that's, that's what's um, like the first and foremost in my mind at, at in this seat in the, in the headquarters office. So it's seeing those partnerships on the ground. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And Peyton, I'd like to give you a chance to, I mean, NLC, so much of what NLC does is bringing people together and supporting these kinds of partnerships, but you know, how are you bringing, how are you doing that to advance nature-based solutions at NLC? Yeah, I mentioned the Smart Surfaces program and the Green Schoolyards program, which are specific technical assistance programs that NLC um, offers. Um, but I would just echo also what my other panelists, the, my fellow panelists said, like Joel's point about how critical it is to break silos horizontally and how critical partnerships are, you know, at every scale. Um, and just highlight that one of the elements we really look at at NLC and that we see, you know, city climate organizations looking at in general is the collaborative governance piece. So working as municipal government with grassroots organizations, recognizing that people know what they need, whether it's nature-based mm -hmm. solutions or something else. So centering those voices, the people who will be most impacted by a program or a policy or a piece of infrastructure, um, and setting up the governance of that, both through the implementation and maintenance, um, is really important to the success. Thanks. Yeah, it's amazing what you learn when you ask somebody, <laughs> and they'll often tell you. <laughs> um, I'm looking for questions. If you have one, please feel free to raise your hand up. Uh, Patrick, please feel free. Hi, I'm Patrick Shea from Senator Baldwin's office from Wisconsin. Um, something, it's kind of following up on maybe your first question. I was wondering how smaller, medium cities can not only keep in mind how nature-based solutions would be effective under climate change, but also under changes in human population. Namely, with changing climate, there's probably going to be shifting demographics going on. I'm thinking smaller and medium-sized cities that would maybe see unexpected, unanticipated population expansion. Um, I'm wondering how a small or medium-sized city could keep that in mind when coming up with a nature-based solution. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, a number of thoughts here, but I'll I'll just say agreed that climate migration dynamics are really critical to consider here in a bunch of ways. Um, but one of the ways that cities across the board, regardless of size, have successfully implemented some of these solutions is having it um, be a part of development requirements. So saying like, yeah, we would love you to build housing. We're seeing a lot of people move here. 
um, part of the community benefits agreement is that you also need to consider X, Y, and Z in the public realm here and, and have nature-based solution requirements. I see some communities with a climate resiliency checklist as part of their zoning implementation under certain articles. Um, so I think a number of land use opportunities in partnering with local developers who are presumably hopefully building housing um, and hopefully affordable housing for um, incoming people. Uh, Joel, Karen, please feel free to uh, chime in as well if you, if you have anything you'd like to offer. I, I would just echo Peyton's point. I was going to say the same thing about working with those developers um, uh, to make sure that the greening aspects are built in at the beginning of the plan. Um, I've happened to live in, in Greenbelt, Maryland, and now live in West Virginia, which are two cities. Greenbelt was the first federally uh, planned city that really incorporated green space from the beginning, and Reston was the first uh, post-World World War II privately planned community that did the same, and I think the benefits speak for themselves. And so when you get um, population changes and you get people migrating to the city and putting a strain on those resources, but if you've already planned for that in the beginning, it makes it so much easier than trying to go in after the fact and, and retrofit um, natural climate solutions in green space. Great. Um, looking for other questions? I have a whole bunch, but oh, shout out for Greenbelt, too. You can tell that they thought about it. And it's called Greenbelt. That's kind of a hint. Uh, oh, uh, we have a question over here. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I remember learning like years ago in university um, that there have been some communities where I'm thinking Detroit, Michigan, where trees were intentionally taken away from communities for surveillance purposes, and communities have kind of fractured trust with governments coming in and putting in whatever in their communities. How do you overcome situations where you have communities that would benefit from trees, but don't feel comfortable having like private groups or the government come in and do interventions in their communities? Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a great example. It's one that I've used previously where um, in the 1960s, they uh, because of invasive species, the city said they were removing a lot of trees in predominantly black neighborhoods. The residents felt it was uh, so that they could be easy, more easily um, surveilled by the police. And so then when uh, neighborhood groups like the Green of Detroit came in decades later to plant trees, there was this natural distrust um, from the residents. And so it goes back to, I think, what I and the, some of the other panelists have repeated is, is really everyone talks about community engagement. Um, as someone who's worked in, in, in this space for a while and has been to different community engagement meetings, you can't show up with a plan that you already have and uh, go to um, a housing meeting room and, and with some hors d'oeuvres and say this is community engagement. You've really got to find out who are the trusted leaders in the community. Um, a good example of that is we've worked with, um, with uh, the Meta, meta Still um, Names escaping me in Baltimore, I'm sorry, but we're working with the faith-based community because they are a trusted partner there and they're um, also one of the biggest landowners in a lot of cities. And so you've got to find who are the trusted partners and communities, engage them at the beginning of the process. And, and when I talked also about culturally relevant trees, that's like a real thing. And so in certain neighborhoods, I think the mayor talked about it as well, you know, their traditional um, uh, and cultural ties that people have to natural climate solutions in the green space. And so you can't just come in offering whatever tree was cheapest for you to acquire. You've got to take the time to really build that trust with true community engagement. And I think that's the only way um, that you're going to avoid issues like that. Because the reality is when you're working in, in communities that need trees the most, speaking just for trees, um, there's generations of distrust of those communities um, uh, at all levels. And so it takes time to break down that trust. And you've got to work with intentionality um, and, and patience to do that. Hey, and, please. Yeah, building off what Joel said, um, I think, you know, we definitely see that with trees, of course, but we're going to see that with all types of climate, nature-based climate solutions. And again, I think building that trust is essential. And part of what that looks like is acknowledging the harm explicitly and also acknowledging that the idea you're coming in with to engage people around might not be the idea that people have in mind. So being willing to actually listen and change course, I think is really important. Um, I experienced that doing neighborhood scale planning in Boston where I came in, or my team came in with an idea and heard something else. And um, we ended up starting with affordable housing conversations instead of a you know, beautiful park conversation. And I think that's really important to do to get, to get it right. Thank you. 
Thanks for the question. All right, well, we will wrap up with just one last one. And this is a question, if you watch ESI briefings, we like to ask a lot. And Karen, we haven't started a question series with you yet, but I'm curious like what you would like to see, how you would like to see the conversation around nature-based solutions maybe shift or advance in the next couple years. What are you, based on what you've seen so far, where would you like to see that conversation go in the next couple years? Um, I think the the multi benefit aspect mm -hmm. of nature based solutions is what's really important, um, and we need to really uh, do a better job at measuring those benefits and then touting those successes and um, ramping up the conversation around those. Um, because as as more people hear about it, and you can actually show and demonstrate measurable benefits, I think that'll bring more people on board and, and expand the use of nature-based solutions. That's great, thank you. Joel, where would you like to see things go? I would like to see us continue these conversations um, and not just talk about extreme heat from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, it's something that impacts the entire country all year round increasingly. Um, and then also, you know, I would be remiss to not talk about the bipartisan nature of this work. And, um, you know, I, I see representatives from Senator Collins' office here, and thanks to the senator for supporting things like the Outdoors for All Act. Um, and uh, Representative Cleaver mentioned the Trees Act, which has been bipartisan. I saw Representative Matsui's staff in here earlier. And so these really are um, solutions that are benefiting red, purple, blue districts across the country. Um, in many instances, they're non-regulatory solutions. Um, and so I know some folks think that the EPA is a, a four-letter word, not a three-letter acronym, but um, the, there's opportunities to advance natural climate solutions that, are, that communities are eager and ready to do. And we should not let, um, we shouldn't let politics get in the way of that. We shouldn't let, uh, again, treating these things as nice to haves or as seasonal issues that only affect certain places. We've got to really understand the enormity of this uh, challenge, that we're all in this together, and that natural climate solutions really are the best way um, for us to improve quality of life for all, all residents of this country. That's great. Thank you. And Peyton, we'll give you the last word today. Great. Well, totally agree with what my fellow panelists said. Um, also, I live in Maine, so shout out to the Maine rep in the room. Um, but I would say, you know, wanting to see us continue the conversation about green infrastructure, period, is really exciting to me. I think Karen framed that as, you know, traditional gray infrastructure, which is still true. It can be kind of the go-to. So continuing to have that conversation is awesome because, you know, nature provides so many fabulous benefits and we need it to survive. And as I've already kind of said um, in other remarks I made, really, really being serious about the unintended consequences, like not seeing it as just a good thing with all of these co-benefits, which it is an amazing thing with so many co-benefits, um, but really acknowledging what the consequences could be um, and just addressing those from the beginning as part of implementation, part of getting it done so that it can benefit everyone and not be a driver of displacement, for example. Because um, we want these solutions and all their benefits to, to be for all and not just those who can afford it. Great. That's a great place to end our briefing today. Thank you to our panelists. I think you all deserve an extended round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so good. Um, before I forget, Joel, you mentioned the bipartisan support for this. I just wanted to mention, I think we just wrote an article that's available on our website about some polling that U.S. Nature for Climate has done. Uh, and so if you want to learn a little bit more about how popular this stuff actually is on a bipartisan basis, that article uh, would be a really good um, source for more information about that. Um, all right, now that I've said that, I can move on to say special thanks to Representative Cleaver and his great staff for his introduction, uh, making that possible, and also for helping us with the room today. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at EESI. Uh, Dan O, who's actually on vacation this week, but he'll get a thanks anyway, he helped. Uh, uh, as well as Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole. Nicole can't be here today, even though she's responsible for that awesome side-by-side -side that I showed earlier, because she's over at the house markup uh, checking things out. So um, thanks to her as well. We also have uh, some uh, really great bench players with us today. Thanks to Jeff, Jonathan, and Ulrich for joining us. We don't always see Ulrich in our briefings, but you did a pretty good job with the timekeeping, so we may have to 
gonna have to talk to David about you being here a little bit more often. So thanks for that. And thanks to Jonathan and Jeff for holding down the front desk. Um, thanks to Brendan for um, our videography today. And Troy, if you're watching, uh, thanks as always. We will be back uh, on June 11th with a briefing called Maximizing the Impact of Natural Climate Solutions. Hmm, seems interesting. Uh, and that's going to be held with our friends at U.S. Nature for Climate as well as the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, also, July 30th, it's a Tuesday, will be our Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. I see Carolyn has come back in the room. Also, thanks to Carolyn and Peyton and the NLC team for making... Uh, Becky's uh, appearance here possible and also just for helping us brainstorm the topic uh, special thanks and um, we really really appreciate your partnership on the briefing as well so this is a link to the survey we're gonna end it here uh, if you have a moment to fill out the survey and tell us what you think we always really appreciate that uh, sorry for going a couple minutes over we always do um, but I uh, really appreciate everyone being here and enjoy the somewhat nice afternoon it's so muggy and gross outside at least it was <laughs> three hours ago when I got here. So do your best to enjoy your Thursday and have a great Memorial Day weekend and we'll be back on June 11th. Thanks.